Thank you all very much for coming today. I realize it's just after lunch. I won't be offended or take it personally if y'all doze off. I've been there. My name is Jen Griffin. This is my good friend Athena Yao, and we are presenting today how we stopped learning, how we <laughs> learned to stop worrying. <laughs> All right, got that out of the way. <laughs> and love, or at least live with GitHub. And we both work with DreamWidth Studios, which if you've not heard of us, there's probably about half a dozen people in this room who will be happy to come fling themselves upon you and tell you more. It um, is a fork from LiveJournal. It's a social blogging site. And we have been involved with Open Source Bridge for several years. Um, you can actually see in here pretty well, but if for whatever reason you want to follow along on your devices, you can download these slides right now from my personal account, slideshare.net slash carzilla. And later today, they should also be available on the main DreamWidth account on SlideShare, slideshare.net slash DreamWidth. And the code that we are going to be talking about today is on GitHub under Afuna's account. And we called it GHI Assist. And if for some reason, at some point, my mic starts to drift away and just like, let me know that you can't hear me. I will try to speak up as well. So, what is GitHub? How many people in this room do not know what GitHub is? We got one, brave man. GitHub is the most widely used platform for managing open source projects. It's really easy to put your code up there slap a license on it, and say, here's my code. Feel free to use it, feel free to make contributions, feel free to tell me what you don't like about it, feel free to tell me what you do like about it. Um, the main purpose of GitHub is providing a single place for the source code management, the, um, I guess, um, canonical site. Um, but it also provides other tools. Um, the one we're gonna be mostly focusing on today is issue management, also known as bug tracking. That's where you keep track of what you want to change about the software, whether it's something you want to add or something that's already there that doesn't quite work the way you want it to. Um, GitHub also provides other collaboration tools like wikis and gists if you want to use those. We're not really gonna be talking about those today. Anyone can easily sign up for a free account, modify a copy of an open source project, and request for their changes to be accepted. This is really the main power of GitHub and why it has become so widespread in the open source community is because how easy it is. It's like a single click to open a pull request. It's a single click to accept and usually to merge a pull request. It's really nice. So here is an example of an open, of, of a GitHub open source project. This is what you see when you go to GitHub slash DreamWidth slash DWFree, which is the open source primary repository for DreamWidth. Over here you can see, um, when you come in you get a list of all of the top level files and the things that are super interesting about this are the three buttons across the top right there. You can watch a project which sends you a notification whenever something interesting happens with the project, like an issue is opened or a change is committed. You can star the project to mark it as one of your favorites, which in the social network aspect of GitHub shows people what you like, what you're tracking. And the most important one is that button that says fork. And that's the one click button for you to make a copy of the project that you're looking at, your own copy that you can modify however you want. You don't have to submit your changes back. It's really easy to do so. We encourage people to do so. You don't have to if you don't want to. And here is an example of someone's profile on GitHub, in this case, my esteemed colleague, who has contributed to not only DreamWidth projects, but some other ones as well. So on the left side here, you can see the most popular repositories that she has contributed to. Some are forks of other projects, some are not. Some are things that she's just worked on herself. And on the right side, you can see a list of the organizations to whom she has contributed, mostly DreamWidth. There's also one from Zorkian up there, one from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, this funky looking graph right here is an indication of 
how frequently she is active on GitHub with changes and commits. Some people love this graph, some people hate it, some people think it's intimidating, um, some people think it's useful. It's there, whether you like it or not. Why use GitHub? So I've talked a little bit already about its strengths. Um, it's pretty much ubiquitous in the open source community. Um, people use it because everybody else uses it, so there's kind of a network effect. Um, again, I've also talked about the ease of use, how easy it is to submit changes and accept changes. And it has some very powerful features that aren't available in other source code management sites. Now some of the weaknesses that we're going to point out, um, not so much with the source code management aspect of it per se, but the other things I talked about, like the issue management, there is no way to customize the bug tracker that GitHub gives you for your project. Um, what you get is what you get. Um, i sorry, I didn't mean to make that a pun, but now that I think about it. <laughs> um, I'm smart and I don't know it. Uh, Git is hard. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys have had the experience of the learning curve of having to s transition to Git from another source code manager. Um, there are probably other tutorials at this very event talking about this phenomenon. Um, we started out on our project with Mercurial, which is a similar distributed source code manager, similar principles. The commands are very different. Um, the feature set is different. So there is a learning curve when you want to transition to Git. Now, my understanding is that GitHub now allows you to use their site with Mercurial repositories as well. I'm seeing some nods. Um, but when we moved to GitHub, that was not an option. Um, all or nothing permissions. I'm going to go into this in more depth soon. But um, when you add someone as a member of your team with commit access, it's kind of an all or nothing thing. Um, what we wanted to do was let people affect issues in the issue tracker without being able to make changes to the code in the code repository, and they're inextricably linked. We couldn't separate the two. So it is possible to use GitHub as a basic code repository and use other products for the rest of your project's workflow. And this is what DreamWidth did when we first moved our code to GitHub. In 2008, when we first forked from LiveJournal, we used a self-hosted Mercurial repository on our own servers to track our changes, and we used Bugzilla to track our issues. And this worked really well for a while until we decided that we wanted to leverage the um, popularity of GitHub and the visibility of GitHub and move our code to it, and also so that we didn't have to continue having someone spend time to maintain our own code source repository. So in 2012, we started gently transitioning, for a while we had both in place, where um, we changed our code management repository from, from Mercurial to Git, and we put it on GitHub. But we continued to use Bugzilla for tracking issues, because we didn't like GitHub's issue tracker. And then, in 2014, we suddenly found ourselves in a situation that we did not anticipate. And we had to move very suddenly from Bugzilla to GitHub issues, because you never see the iceberg coming. Um, yeah, we woke up one day and the server that, the virtual server that our Bugzilla database lived on had been erased with, we thought we had backups. They were not useful backups. So all of that was gone. So moving forward, we decided to start from scratch with GitHub and try to make it work for us. Now, the question you might be asking yourselves is, why did we wait to make the switch? Um, a few reasons. Um, Bugzilla provides more flexible, powerful metadata when you're tracking individual issues. Um, things like links to external sources can be put in fields instead of in comments. Things like um, product fields, areas of the code you might be targeting, those can all be metadata on a bug in Bugzilla that GitHub does not provide. Um, 
easier drop-in contributions. Um, we have a lot, a lot of contributors on Dreamwidth who have never contributed to open source before. A lot of them aren't really sure that they're interested in learning how to contribute to our code, but they see something misspelled on the site, or they see a page that something's out of alignment, and they want to tell us about it. So when we had Bugzilla, can you wiggle the mouse? Can you wiggle the mouse? Sorry. When you um, when you uh, go to Bugzilla, you can just type in your email address and your password, and boom, you've got a Bugzilla account, and you can file a bug, and you may never go back to Bugzilla again. But it's really easy and painless. With GitHub, there's this whole thing like setting up a developer profile that is really intimidating to a lot of people. Um, also, better permissions and privacy. One thing that we liked about Bugzilla that we have not been able to reproduce with the GitHub issue tracker is the ability to have an issue marked private that only developers can see because security issues. Um, so yeah, we're investigating other alternative avenues for that, but GitHub issues does not provide us that. So bottom line, Bugzilla is a more fully featured bug tracker than GitHub issues. So. We considered our options. We considered starting over from scratch again with Bugzilla, just starting up a new database and continuing on like we had before. We rejected this. We didn't really want to continue hosting our own bug tracking surface. Um, there was also always the possibility that something like what had just happened would happen again. Um, we didn't want to spend time on it. so. We also actually have money that we can throw at the problem, wow. So we considered using a different hosted bug tracker. We wanted to look at the opportunity to pay someone else money to do this for us, which we rejected because we couldn't find anything that fit our needs. Now your mileage may vary on this. Our particular project has a lot of casual contributors and a lot of the products in this space charge per user. So this was not a viable alternative for us. We also looked at moving to GitHub with one particular repository under our organization that would be used specifically for tracking issues, and then we could give everybody in our organization commit access to just that repository and not have any code in it. Um, we rejected that as too confusing and hard um, for people, not, not to set up, but for people to use. What we finally decided was we would use GitHub issues normally the way it's intended to be used and we would do our best to work around the rough spots and try to adapt our workflow to what it provided as opposed to what we were used to using. Change is hard. Um, GitHub permissions for Teams. I'm gonna go into this a little more in depth but I'm going to gloss over some um, things that aren't relevant to our use case. Um, so anyone, and when I say anyone, I mean anyone on the internet who has a web browser, doesn't have to have an account. Anyone on GitHub can browse, create, and comment on issues, fork the code, and submit pull requests. Well, you have to have an account to fork the code. But um, anybody can do that without having to be a member of your organization. Members of your organization, which means people who are listed in your team, they can also have issues assigned to them by the admins, they cannot assign issues to themselves, but the, the, the admins, the people in charge of the project, can assign them issues and be referenced by name in comments, which is good for collaboration and getting people's attention. Um, and then admins, and when I say admins, I'm including people with commit access to the project as well as the owners of the organization. I'm lumping those together. Admins can commit code changes and make changes to issues including labels and assignments. So they can do all these changes themselves because they've got full access. Now that's what GitHub gives you out of the box. What we wanted looked more like this. Um, anyone, same, can browse, create, comment, fork, and submit pull requests. Admins, same, can commit all the changes and make all of the changes to issues including labels and assignments. But we wanted members of the organization, not necessarily with right access, but people that we knew and had submitted a CLA. Um, we wanted members to also be able to assign the issues to themselves so that we didn't have to do it for them. 
we wanted them to be able to categorize existing issues with labels so that we didn't have to take on that task all by ourselves. We wanted to be able to let people help with that who were interested in making things easier to search for to see what was going on with the site, but were not necessarily interested in submitting code changes and certainly weren't interested in being able to commit code changes. That's intimidating to a lot of people. So, enter the API. GitHub provides a programming interface for interacting with issues and pull requests. And you can find out more about this interface by going to developer.github.com. Um, when you have an API listener set up, notifications are sent to it when items are opened, closed, commented on, those are the main three. And since anyone, anyone with a GitHub account can comment on an issue, anyone can trigger the API actions. What we do is we look for specially formatted comments that tell the API what we want to do. So how it works, the service is similar to a chatbot. We just have a little program listening on a web server somewhere. It listens for GitHub API events, which GitHub knows to send it because it's registered with the API, and it responds as desired, depending on how you program it. In order to execute the requested actions, it will need to be linked to a GitHub account that has access to commit the changes. So you have to create an account, and you have to give it the access that it needs. And it's a good idea to give it a name, like GitHub bot or something, so that people know that it's an automated process and don't go, hey, who is this guy who's always jumping on me? Um, Currently defined actions. So this is just what we defined for our needs within our code, and we're gonna go through this in just a moment. The three things that we can do are assign a related issue. So one of the functions that GitHub supplies natively is when you open a pull request, if you put in the field, fixes, issue number, blah, blah, blah. What our API request adds to that functionality is instead of just closing the issue, when the pull request is committed, which is what GitHub does automatically, this will also go in and assign the issue before the pull request is even merged, it will assign the issue to the person who submitted the pull request. So that's cool. Because people are always going in looking for things that have been unassigned that need to be worked on. And if they wanted to go work on something that wasn't assigned but actually had a pull request open, that would be a duplication of effort. Um, the second thing is claiming an issue, which is similar to the first, except this doesn't necessarily have an associated pull request. Um, you can comment saying, I'm claiming this, or this is claimed, or any variation of the word claim. And it will automatically assign the issue, assuming it is already unassigned, to the person who left that comment. Um, they do have to, I put an asterisk here because they do have to be a member of your team for that assignment to be successful. And then a uh, third thing is adding labels, which again is useful for categorizing and searching for open issues. Labels can be added via comments by pref prefixing the name of the label with two pound signs, which um, the label name also has to be defined in your server or it will be ignored. All right, that's the end of my part of the presentation. I'm going to hand off to Athena, and she's gonna show you all how this works. All right, um, test it. Hey, so uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Um, so she's given, a, she's given you an idea of what happens. I'm gonna show you how that all works in practice. Hang on. Okay, so, you know, you're creating an issue, it's a sample issue. You say, um, this is for OS Bridge. Hi, folks. You create the issue. You create the issue. And the bot goes in and it marks it as untriaged. And that basically just means, okay, so the issue has come in, we haven't, we haven't given it any labels. It doesn't, it, it might need someone to look at it and might need further processing. Next thing you can do, now let's go ahead and do a label. Where did the labels go? Um, that's not helpful. So, 
So we have a white list of labels that can be applied. And some of this, the defaults that uh, GitHub created for you are things like bug, enhancement, duplicate. So we can uh, whitelist that in the server in your webhook. And you, you, know, you can say, now I'm going to create a, uh, this is going to be marked a bug. It's a whitelist, so if it's just like some random text, that doesn't, it's not going to label it as such. Um, comment. Oh, there you go. So it's now, OK, you can label. Cool. The final thing is, you probably, someone at some point will want to walk over here and want to work on the bug. You want to claim it. So OK, this looks kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. Claiming. And there's a little, you can say claim, you can say claiming, you can say claimed. Claim, claimed, claiming. It's a, it's a little, it doesn't distinguish, because that way you don't have to remember the exact syntax. It's a little annoying. You can just talk as you would normally. And you know the bot goes ahead and assigns it to, assigns the status claim. So this um this last one especially is the kind of thing that was very frustrating for us because you you have contributors come in all the time and they haven't submitted any code yet but they want to work on stuff. And you can't assign issues to them without them going up to you and telling you or asking you, could, could you please let me work on this code? Like, what's up with that? So that's, you know, open an issue, label the issue, comment on the issue, uh, assign the issue. So next thing, Carla and I actually, Jen and I, as we were looking at the document, uh, as we were looking at the code, we realized we probably do want to improve documentation for setup at some point, because there's a lot of fiddly bits, things that just need to go in the right place, right order. So you know, improve documentation for setup. Let's make this happen. So OK, now we're going to open a new issue for it. So issue 20, improve documentation for setup. As it happens the other night, we had realized that we you know, could improve the documentation, wrote the documentation, and now we're going to submit it. So this is documentation for all required setup. This fixes. Yep. Just want to pull this side by side. That shows that. This shows this. Fixes, whoops, what did I do? Fixes number 20. And right now, so that's new, no one's assigned, no one's labeled, nothing's anything. We create the pull request. And that just references the issue. Hang on. And it automatically assigns it to Carla because she's 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 volunteered to do stuff for us. Voluntold, she got voluntold to work on this. Um, and so basically, it's very simple. But a lot of it is it makes things automatic. It makes things so that you can tell because you can't customize GitHub, but now you sort of can. You don't have to do all the work manually. You don't have to remember to go through all your issues. Now you just, when things happen, things are also organized automatically. Um, the, the additional documentation for setup in this pull request, we will merge that at the end of this talk. So what just happened here? Like, why, 
right? What happened here? When the user add, added a comment, so it gets sent to GitHub, GitHub fires an event. It sends an, H, uh, it sends an HTTP request, it sends a post uh, request to our webhook. Our webhook, in, in this case, is a simple Python server that we registered with GitHub, told it, okay, when these specific events happen, when someone makes a new pull request, when someone makes a new comment, when someone makes a new issue, please let us know about it. Send us the relevant information, send us the relevant data. It comes to us and we look at the payload, we decide if there's anything interesting about it. If there is anything interesting, then we send back an API action to GitHub, otherwise we just ignore it, it's fine. Just to show you that this is not That, you know, this is just like simple HTTP requests. These are just, um, oh, what did I do? You changed the tab. Sorry. Oh, maybe I closed it? No, it's over here. Cool. I'm not. Okay. Just to show you that this is not, you know, any kind of complicated thing, we're now just, going to send a curl request to our webhook. You know, it's the webhook over here. Um, with a payload of just a random string, ABC, that makes it a post request. And we're gonna send a header that says, okay, this is a ping. We're just gonna ping, you don't need to do anything about this. We're just letting you know, very kindly, that stuff happened. And so this, the webhook responds to the ping and just says pong, whatever. Um, so this is the very, very simple case. GitHub actually sends you something that looks more like this. And it, it has the same things. It has the URL, it has the, the kind of event, it has the signature. It has more information, like more relevant information. In this case, it's a ping, it doesn't really send anything interesting. But for an issue, it sends all this stuff in JSON. Um, the issue, the, com what, uh, the new comment, the new, the date, whatever labels are currently on the request. I would uh, also like to note, by the way, that this kind of information, uh, GitHub keeps a history of all events, of all notification it, it has sent to your webhook. It keeps it under the webhook settings, under your, your repository settings. And it is very nice because it has things like this little read deliver button, which if you click on it, in this case it's just a screenshot, won't do anything. But if you click on it, it will, do what it says, re-deliver the event exactly as it was to your um, webhook. I will tell you this kind of saves on debugging because it, it's kind of annoying to open a gajillion requests issues and just make up fake things all over and over again. All right, so now let's go a little deeper into it. Um, let's see what the code does. It's very, very simple. It actually is straightforward. So the three things you want your webhook to do are you want to verify that the request comes from GitHub. It's not just some random thing someone sent you. You want to determine the event type, then you want to do some kind of action based on the payload contents. So when verifying the request came from GitHub, what you don't want to do actually is have someone, you know, who knows the name, who knows where your thing is hosted. Send you a ping or, or tell you, oh, we have a new issue comment. You know, someone made a new comment. 
don't want them to be able to just do that because you want to be able to verify that this thing comes from GitHub, that you can trust the contents of what was sent to you. So in this case, I just sent a random string. I sent, I sent it to the, my web hub. It was not happy. It basically tells me, OK, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're doing. The imp In order to verify that the content actually comes from GitHub, we use the, GitHub uses a, share, uh, a shared secret. This is, you know, this is a string, a token, that is known to both GitHub and to your API server, and, uh, and to your webhook server, sorry. It means if the secrets don't match, then you don't, then the signatures don't match. It uses the secret token. It hashes it with the payload contents. And if, this, uh, if the signature GitHub sends you does not match what you expect, then you can just tell them to go away, because it's not them. Or, or it could mean you misconfigured something. But So you verify the request came from GitHub, and that's straightforward. You grab the signature. The signature is in the format of SHA-1 is equal to hash of the signature to the payload. You check if the signature is valid. <coughs> um, so you read in the body of the request. Make sure it's a string. This uh, example is for bottle. Various other web frameworks do other different things. And the more interesting part is you want to make sure um, Is that so? You know, you generate your own signature here with the when you're creating Mac hex digest. Um, it's straightforward. Uh, GitHub provided a reference implementation in Ruby. I don't think they had one in Python. I looked around, didn't see anything. Um, the thing that you want to be careful of is in newer versions of Python, you want to be using hmac.compareDigest. You do not want to be using the equal equal sign because that leaves you vulnerable to timing attacks where people can, or people can use the response time where people can, um, Basically, it leaves you vulnerable to security issues. So as much as possible, if you're using a newer version of Python, then you want to be using Compare Digest. If you're not, then you're kind of out of luck. But you still need to. It's better than having no signature. It's better than having no way to compare, to verify that it came from GitHub. Determine the event type. And that is a lot easier. You just get from the headers. It means you don't have to go through the payload. You don't have to guess what they're sending. They just tell you up front. It's fine. Do some action based on the payload contents. And that's where things get interesting. In our case, we did three different things. If you wanted to do it yourself, you could, you could decide your own actions, right? You can do more organization. But in our case, so this is what the claim hook kind of looks like. It's very simplified. But we check, does it, is there a word there that's you know, claim, claimed, or claiming? We ignore the case. If it's not already assigned, then we assign it. If it's not already assigned, then we want to claim it. We want to go forward and claim it. If it is assigned, or if, it, if there's no such, um, if there's nothing interesting in the comment body, then you don't care. You just don't do anything. To send the uh, request to GitHub is fairly straightforward. You just send a request to uh, GitHub's API. Um, in this case, we use a patch request. Most of the time, you end up using a put. But in this case, so you use a patch. You have your GitHub API URL. 
It's probably the issue comment. Um, you get the, you can actually get the URL from the payload that GitHub sends you. Headers, relevant headers are, you probably want to tell them, okay, GHI is this bot. Authorization, this is a token that you generate on the bot's account. You go to your, uh, you go to the bot's settings, GitHub settings, you generate a personal access token that tells it for this application, it does like a password for this specific application. You want to make sure it's the bot's account, not your account, because otherwise everything that passes through the webhook is now going to be tied to your, all, all its actions are going to be tied to you, not to your bot. It's not, it's not the best thing to do. Um, and then you just give it some, some JSON. In this case, we are just setting your assignee to, you know, we're just setting the assignee. In other cases, you can do other things. But again, there's a simple HTTP request, just uses the request API. Um, and that's it. Um, so resources, again, the webhook is up on GitHub under Funda slash GHI assist. The API reference is very useful for looking at, figuring out the kinds of things you can do, will want to do, are able to do. The slides are up on slideshare.net slash dreamwith. If you have any questions, you can find us online. I am Karela at Dreamwith. She is Afuna at Dreamwith. Those are also our usernames on GitHub and on Twitter. It's consistent everywhere, so that's helpful. And we just want to thank you all for coming today. And this is time to ask questions if you have questions. Thank you very much.